Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you had a, a good lunch um, and um, uh, an interesting um, attendance of side events, if you did that, or um, an interesting conversation with your fellow delegates. Welcome to this session on uh, freedom of expression and fake news, a subject which has dominated, I think, um, conferences um, of the media, um, but also um, intergovernmental org organizations and um, academia. Uh, in recent times, uh, a phenomenon that has exploded as a subject um, across society also um, just in the last year. Uh, in this panel, we will be able to delve into some of the subject matter that was touched upon earlier today. Um, more specifically, we'll look at what is fake news, are there any definitions, how different it is, is it from um, other harmful speech such as hate speech, uh, what are its implications? What are its effects? Um, more specifically, why is it a problem? And what are the range of possible responses to fake news? What is acceptable from the perspective of international human rights law, the basis of the OSC's own commitments here in this region? Joining me on this panel are uh, Barbara Bukowska, Senior Director for Law and Policy at Article 19, the leading international non-governmental organization on freedom of expression on my right. David Mickelson, the founder of Snopes.com, a fact-checking uh, site, which he'll tell us more about later. And finally, uh, to speak will be Danish um, Radcevicius, uh, the chairman of the Lithuanian Journalists Association, who will look at some of the approaches to fake news uh, in Lithuania. Before handing over to the speakers, I'd just like to once again highlight the very significant document which was adopted in this room, I think, on the 3rd of March, the Joint Declaration on uh, Disinformation, Propaganda and Fake News, adopted by this, the representative um, uh, for freedom of, the, freedom of the Media from the OSCE, uh, the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression, the African Commission uh, for Human and People's Rights, Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression and Access to Information, and the Inter-American uh, Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression. This is, in our view, the officer's view, the state of the art when it comes to acceptable responses to fake news. Um, and I encourage all of you, whether uh, delegates from states, uh, media representatives, or civil society representatives, to take a look at that. Undoubtedly, this issue of so-called fake news is going to um, be a, an important subject matter for um, intergovernmental authorities going into the future. But um, for now, we have this uh, esteemed panel to uh, discuss the subject. Um, so um, first to speak will be um, Barbara. Um, and uh, it would be great, Barbara, if you could uh, um, perhaps highlight some of the problems with fake news and, and the responses to fake news also. Um, and also just set out some of the international legal um, uh, kind of constraints or the international legal framework for dealing with fake news. Thanks. Thank you, Sejal, and it's a great pleasure to be here with you today. So thank you very much to the Office of the OSC representative on freedom of the media for the invitation to this important conference. As Sejal said, Article 19 is an international freedom of expression organization, works globally and also quite prominently in the OSC region. And we have been really uh, lucky to have a great support and great cooperation with the Special Representative on Freedom of the Media for OSC region. And uh, of course, with the concern, we know that the mandate is not yet filled. So we are very much hoping that the representative will be appointed very soon and that we can continue our fruitful cooperation with the new mandate holder as well as with the, with the office. So in my opening remarks, I'm just going to speak, as uh, Sejal prompted me, about some key terminology and some key legal and policy implications of the problem uh, at hand, and uh, also speak from the point of view of the International Freedom of Expression Organization, and then I will also try to outline some possible solution from the legal and policy perspective to this problem. So I want to start actually looking at what uh, Sajal uh, asked me to, to look at this uh, term fake news or false news or misinformation as a key issue in this debate. Uh, the, the term has become a huge part of the global lexicon recently, but its meaning have been actually blurred to a potential 
meaninglessness. And uh, understanding of the terminology, however, is important when we want to come with some solutions to the issues at hand. Uh, the, the same as the beauty is in the eyes, eyes of beholder, fake news can be uh, perceived and defined differently by different actors and different people in this debate. It can refer, and we have seen often, especially in the OSC region, to be used as a slur against journalists and against those who are critical of the government. It can be also referring to a deliberately false information which is circulated online or offline. It can also refer to tabloid stories, to celebrity gossips, to PR or infotainment, but it can also refer to governmental, military and political propaganda or propaganda of war. So it basically it really varies from person to person and it is not a new phenomenon. So we often hear the, the, the term that we have moved to the post-truth era where facts no longer matter, but especially in this region with the Cold War uh, history. Uh, we have seen that it's a not new issue and have not been uh, limited to a po particular political climate. So in a way, the term fake news is a misnomer. And uh, at Article 19, as a free speech organization, we actually encourage people not to use it and rather look at specific harm or a specific issue which is being propagated But what people refer to fake news. So in many instances, it can really be various social ills which we can tackle from free speech perspective. It can be a, a deliberate propaganda by state or it can also amount to hate speech and incitement to hatred and we have seen uh, such instances in OSC region especially in Balkans where it led to genocide or currently in the Ukraine and Russia conflict. It can also uh, refer, uh, refer to information which can cause some harm in terms of help. So for example the the rumors or um, some sort of hoaxes about the vaccines being harmful to children. So we really need to look at the particular issue at hand when we are dealing with this phenomenon and rather try to tackle the underlying problems with the terminology refers to then come up with one fits for all solution to uh, fighting fake news. But finding a solution to this problem and to basically to preventing circulation of disinformation or deliberately false information is difficult at best and also can violate human rights at worst. And this is what we actually see very frequently in this region and globally around the world. We see that the governments are criminalizing, either maintained on the books or are using the legislation which uh, prohibits false news, spreading false news, and, are, um, the, and the sharing of rumors, but are applying such prescriptions to everything from ordinary social media users to targeting the political opponents, such as countries like Turkey, uh, but also in um, the abusive, use it, using in abusive way other legislation which can be used for those social ills I mentioned before, so such as restrictive and uh, the misusing of the legislation on hate speech or uh, misusing legislation on defamation or other, other problems. But even in the countries where there are some checks and balances, the media is often seen as an opposition actor and this makes it very easy for the uh, press freedoms and for media freedoms to be eroded, so we have to be mindful of that. Uh, more importantly and more concerningly, uh, we also need to keep in mind that in many countries, the governments are often sources and dissemination, disseminators of deliberately false and misleading information. And then as a result, the rumors are rampant, some of them are true, some of them are false, and the proposals to regulate false news or fake news then are often coming from the individuals and from the institutions that are actually the authors of this misinformation, but also are responsible for creating the restrictive regulations and legislations. And this is also a problem in this region, but beyond. We have seen the, the cases in US, around the US election, presidential election in UK, around Brexit campaign, which was uh, deliberately false and augmented the anti-migrant themes, but also in countries like Russia, Hungary, Turkey, to name few. 
And there is a great risk of uh, democracies moving towards stricter regulation and the restrictions on press freedom under the flag of fighting misinformation. So we have to be mindful of that. Also, uh, we have seen uh, more and more the calls on uh, stronger legislation against social media because the social media, although um, have been greatly empowering users to be independent producers of information and connecting people to each other, they have also, in a way, um, ameliorated the problem of disinformation being able to spread more swiftly. And uh, they made it uh, also much more easier and also much more emotional. And despite the fact that they play various roles in the way how people receive and disseminate information, they also sometimes play the role of traditional media. So what we do with the social media and uh, fake news or false news is an issue of concern and we need to make sure that any restrictions and any new legislation or regulations meet traditional and establish freedom of expression standards. But now uh, I have talked about some problems which we see from free speech perspective. So the question now is what is the solution to our problem? And it has been already outlined in the morning at the opening statements, but it's also often asked to organizations like Article 19 and OIC to Human Rights Institution, what is the solution to fake news? So my answer to this is that all the problems and all the the answers are provided in this important document that uh, Sejal mentioned and that was actually adopted in this room a couple months ago in the early March uh, 2017 of four special rapporteurs on the right to freedom of expression, David Kaya who spoke in the morning, Dunja, uh, Dunja Mijatovic who was a special representative for OSC region and uh, special rapporteur for Organization of American States and African Union they um, adopted the joint declaration of freedom of expression and fake news. Interestingly, the term fake news is only used in the term twice, once in the title, and why, once as a concern. So they outline a very comprehensive uh, set of measures which should be applied by the governments and other stakeholders to this problem. And they start, I hope that you are familiar with this document or maybe the, uh, the OSC can uh, provide some prints, but it's also available online. So I encourage all of you to familiarize with this document because it starts from the position of uh, ensuring that there is no undue and illegitimate censorship of the media. And it talks about the appropriate uh, framework under which freedom of expression can be restricted under international human rights standards and freedom of expression standards. It talks about uh, the measures which the states mustn't do to uh, restrict individuals, media, and social uh, media giants or uh, the digital companies. And then also very importantly speaks about the enabling environment for freedom of expression in wh which is the best suited to counter rumors and propaganda and disinformation. So they talk about the issues such as uh, positive regulatory framework for the media. They talk about, uh, uh, and this is very important also in the light of what uh, the opening statement talk about the, the attacks on the independent journalism on providing the, uh, the and promoting the framework for media diversity and pluralism and for also the support to public service media uh, as an important uh, player in diverse and pluralistic media environment. And then it also speaks with the uh, specific uh, recommendations to other stakeholders such as intermediaries, uh, the journalists and the media outlets as well as the civil society. So if you want to see the set of solutions and if somebody asks you what to do with it, you just refer them to joint declaration and also to the recommendations within. So Article 19 obviously promotes the joint declaration and recommendations outlined in here, but we also think that civil society can play a very important role in tackling the problem of of fake news and civil society meaning in a very broad term, not just NGOs, but also the academic institutions and other groups in the society, fact-checking organizations and independent media. And they can also provide support to the communities and groups that are often affected uh, by fake news or other uh, problems that are underlying under this term. 
So I very much hope that we can explore these issues further in this conversation and uh, we, will, we will have a further discussion about these issues after other speakers make their presentations. Thank you. Thanks very much, Barbara. I think Barbara's presentation really highlights a number of important um, aspects of this discussion. First, that um, fake news, um, the term, attracts a very broad range of definitions. Um, a range of harms flow from the application or the um, justification of restrictions on fake news, um, socioeconomic, political harms, health-related harms. Um, that there are a number of concerns from the um, civil society sector about um, over-regulation or regulation of fake news and this um, framework which is um, set out in the joint declaration. I'd just like to read you one particular um, a statement made in the joint declaration by these four leading experts, um, intergovernmental, so appointed by you, the states, experts um, on freedom of expression, and that is this. General prohibitions on the dissemination of information based on vague and ambiguous ideas, including fake, false news or non-objective information, are incompatible with international standards for freedom of expression, as set out in Article 19 of the uh, International Covenants on Civil and Political Rights. Um, okay, um, one thing Barbara's presentation um, highlighted was that this, this phenomenon of fake news is not new, and yet there is a newness about it in the way that it's um, being disseminated um, over social media. So perhaps that is the, uh, the new um, nature of it or the way we experience it. Um, turning now to our next speaker, David Mickelson, um, who uh, runs a fact-checking website called Snopes.com, um, which when I looked up, I was surprised to learn that it was set up in 1994. So, um, so David has been dealing with this at the, at the very front line uh, for a very long time, and we are very grateful that he's with us here in Vienna um, to uh, talk about um, uh, Snopes.com. Oh. Uh, good you. afternoon, everyone. Uh, said I'm David Mickelson, the founder of Snopes.com, which is the oldest fact-checking site on the internet. I've been doing this since 1994 or so. Um, I'd like to start by saying I'm honored to be among such august company because even though I'm one of the pioneers in fighting misinformation and fake news on the internet, I have never had to set foot in a combat zone. I have never had to risk my life or safety in pursuit of a story, so I'm humbled to be in the presence of those of you who have. Um, although this conference is mostly focused on the political and much of what we do at Snopes is debunking and affirming you know, political topics. Uh, I thought I'd give a presentation on something a little bit lighter that's non-political to kind of give you an idea of what we do and how we do it. Uh, so, as our example, we have a story that was quite popular a couple of months ago, um, seemingly from the Mississippi Herald newspaper uh, about a young couple who had recently married and were having trouble conceiving a child. So they visited a fertility clinic to see about you know, in vitro fertilization or alternative conception methods and were shocked when routine DNA testing revealed that they were twins, that they uh, had been given up for adoption by their parents and had gone to separate homes, uh, grew up not knowing that they had a sibling, uh, coincidentally met in college and got married and then when they tried to have children, discovered, oh my gosh, we're brother and sister. Um, and this story was widely covered all over the internet. It showed up in the Daily Mail, which is one of the most trafficked news sites on the internet. Uh, it showed up in another UK tabloid, The Sun, as reproduced by Fox News. Uh, we see this same story in The Inquisitor, which is a US-based news website. Uh, the, again, the same story in The Metro from the UK. Uh, and The Evening Standard, all running this same story about the husband and wife who discovered that they were biological twins. Um, and here we have, yes, another example of, from The Mirror. And this was not just you know, a frivolous news story. I don't know if you can read this, but of course there was much passion discussion on the internet about this story, about how terrible it was that these 
children were placed in foster homes, didn't know they had siblings, someone dropped the ball, didn't let them know uh, that, you know, was it going to be the case now that the government would force them to divorce each other? Uh, you know, the heartbreaking tale of people who married couple who had to say goodbye to each other and even if the government could force them to get divorced, they couldn't stop them from having sexual relations. Um, you know, and as, as the bottom line says here, it was a terrible price to have to pay for someone's stupidity. Uh, but shortly afterwards, and a funny thing happened, you see the, the Daily Mail's page about this story disappeared. Uh, the Metro's page on this story disappeared. Uh, the Evening Standards page on this story disappeared. Uh, the Inquisitors at least had a little bracketed bit at the end to say it was updated. Uh, a few publications actually went back and didn't just disappear their story, but noted that it appeared to be fake. Um, you know, here's another example for where the Mirror updated their pay story to say it appeared to be fake. Uh, so what happened here? Well, a lot of it was that we uh, went and debunked this story and put out there that no, the story is actually false. So how do we know that? Um, well, one clue is all of those newspapers got their story from that one article in the Mississippi Herald. Well, who was the Mississippi Herald? Well, you look at a list of newspapers in Mississippi, they're not showing up on that list. No one seems to know who the Mississippi Herald is. Uh, if you go to the Mississippi Herald's website and click on contact us, what do you see? You would expect to see maybe a physical address, uh, the names and email addresses and phone numbers of reporters, uh, you know, information about the editorial staff, and none of that is there. It's just a generic send us email form with some ads on it. Uh, even more telling, this exact same story ran in something called the Denver Inquirer five months earlier. A very same story, couple shocked to find out they're biological twins. Uh, the only difference is it's in Denver, Colorado instead of Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, probably not likely this same story would happen twice in the span of five months. Uh, and Another interesting coincidence, the Denver Inquirer's contact us page looks a lot like the Mississippi Herald's, completely lacking in information, but with the very same ads. Um, so <laughs> how else do we know this is not a very good story, not, not accurate? It missed all the basics of reporting, which is uh, the, the name of the clinic that these people supposedly visited wasn't given. All we know is it happened in some city, such as Denver, where there would be a lot of clinics. How would a reporter narrow that down and find the right one? Uh, the, the patients involved in this story were never identified. They weren't even quoted. Uh, the whole story is based on a lengthy quote from a doctor who's never identified other than as the doctor, no name. Um, and of course, in the United States, as in many other countries, I'm sure, we have uh, law, privacy laws protecting health information. So doctors are not free to just blab about your personal health care and information to the press without your permission. So this story couldn't have gotten out unless the people involved had agreed to it and they were not named or quoted in the story, so they probably didn't. Um, and as I noted, we have the problem that it's the very same story, the very same unusual story in two different places, but still the same story. Um, so that leads me into what I noted at the problem. Is this a problem with fake news or is it a problem with bad journalism? Because um, we look to journalists, we look to news media to help us fight fake news, and this is a case where the news media were spreading a fake news story. Now, granted, these publications are not exactly paragons of journalism. They're not, you know, the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or Le Monde. They're kind of tabloids 
or you know splashy news outlets like the Daily Mail, but they are still what the audience considers news, a place they're looking to for accurate information, and they're not getting it. Um, so that highlights a problem in how we move forward in trying to get the news media to, to lead the fight against fake news, uh, and we kind of have to be careful about who the news media are. Thank you very much, um, David, um, for um, a really sort of interesting uh, story uh, about um, uh, one um, situation in the United States um, showing just how um, fake news can really be taken up and spread and also raises this very important question of um, the, you know, whether, whether fake news is really an issue about journalism and, and goes back to what Barbara was saying about the, the need to ensure that there is a positive enabling environment for the media where the media is supported. Um, so turning now to our third and, and last speaker, uh, Danish um, Radisevich, um, who has been working on the issue of uh, fake news um, from the perspective of um, the uh, leader of a journalist union in, in Lithuania. Thanks, Danish. Thank you very much. <coughs> um, actually, I will speak a little bit more uh, from very practical aspects uh, and uh, for me, it's not easy, actually, to speak about a uh, fake news issue from some legal environment, you know, because uh, we discussed many times uh, what kind of definition would be, like, best for fake news. I will try, actually, to speak of, um, can I get, you know, for next slide. Thank you. Um, I will speak, like, a um, person who has some experience with, um, let's say, how we can lie for <laughs> each other. And uh, on one side, uh, we have very, very much uh, stories, you know, very many stories about um, techniques, how we can lie in very small issues, you know, on every uh, day basis. Sometimes if I like to be alone at home or somewhere outside Lithuania, I can send for my wife, I'm busy very much. And I do it uh, sometimes, you know. It's not true, actually, mostly, but um, how we can describe uh, news or messages or stories like this. And uh, we know also we have smartphones, most of us. We can take pictures every day. And we have a regime like beauty, which is not true, actually, but that it shows for us how good we can be, like, in some <laughs> light. And uh, one of most uh, challenging issues for journalist society, it's uh, not fake news like this, but actually uh, fake news which are um, organized by some, um, let's say, uh, uh, strategic uh, proposals. Uh, and uh, we are dealing now in Lithuania with um, some cases uh, which are related to aggressive communication, actually. We don't speak about fake news uh, with very small stories, but we have uh, examples uh, how uh, some tools, some social networks, and also sometimes some kind of professional media, so-called professional media, they use small fake stories uh, or small stories from, 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 from social networks as um, as an um, argument to provide some uh, Mm, aggressive communication uh, because uh, now we face uh, mm, very few challenges in our region, you know. We have uh, uh, every day some messages from state structures, from Ministry of Defense, from uh, NATO structures about some, mm, let's say, incidents somewhere. And for media, uh, especially after war in Ukraine, it's not easy to deal with messages like this because most of media, they know it's very important for us and uh, they need to be as quick as they can, they can but uh, we have problem with uh, checking of facts. And for example, a uh, few days ago, um, we find it somewhere in social networks, fake story about an uh, incident in Klaipeda city and it was strange for me because uh, this story was published by some person on one of the most popular uh, news portal. And this message this morning still was uh, an open assess. I was asking editor-in-chief, look, you have fake story for a couple of days, an English version. 
He said, but we now have also Lithuanian version uh, about the story, and we told for our readers it's fake story. I said, look, but English version is still like a uh, new story. I said, who cares about English version? We are dealing with Lithuanian audience. We don't care about English version or other languages versions. But uh, we had some small discussion this morning, and he said, OK, OK, you'll provide a little more information. I'll say it's fake story. Um, why I'm speaking about stories like this? Because I have personal experience, and uh, even a few days ago, I got some messages from my colleague. He found a new comment, an article about uh, Mr. Trump and uh, Lithuanian policy. An article was written in, in Russian language uh, in some small portal. And some columnists, they use it still, this interview, uh, as an argument speaking about some conflicts between Lithuania and America. This story was created one, years ago, one year ago. And um, for me, it was a funny story, actually, because I never met Mr. Trump. <laughs> and I got a lot of messages from my colleagues in Uzbekistan in many countries. They said, OK, you are a good journalist if you have a chance to speak with Mr. Trump so open about many, many stories. I said, look, uh, never done interview like this, but uh, still, uh, till nowadays, I have uh, some conversations with colleagues who can find the story uh, many, many small portals outside Lithuania, and they use as a source still, even if you can find uh, very clear information that this is fake, but uh, nobody caring. Uh, and we have also experience like for one year, or a little more than one year, when we, um, as a journalist uh, and editorial, uh, we get a lot of uh, information from people, uh, fake accounts, uh, social networks, with fake stories. Uh, mostly they are related somehow to soldiers, NATO soldiers, how bad they are. And some of journalists was uh, publishing some, some, some stories, but uh, just in the very beginning, and now we don't have problems like this. Um, for me and for my colleagues in European Federation of Journalists, uh, it's a very interesting issue you know, to discuss about fake news. On one hand, we usually speak about some definitions, some problems, some challenges, maybe some new regulation. But everyone, uh, we understand that people who are sometimes making some fake news and very small issues, if they are more popular with news, uh, most of news portals, uh, newspapers, they are reacting on such cases. And they provide uh, very clear information about fake stories, with real story. And it's like no problem, actually. But the biggest challenge for us is actually organized um, fake stories, which are organized by some big structures. And um, um, when we discuss about ethic issues and, and the ethic of journalists, we have a lot of proposals how uh, professional journalists and especially young professional journalists ha can deal with fake news. But what we can do if we speak about um, audience, about society, about people, about regular people, um, we have the biggest challenge, I, I guess, nowadays, not a journalist society, not a professional society, not a self-regulation system, but actually uh, people who are living uh, in information bubbles, and, and they have like one or two sources, which they like very much. And uh, they like stories uh, like, uh, like I showed you for, for you, and uh, they don't trust no one who are speaking against them. And we have now a lot of programs uh, which are related to media literacy. But for the future, I would say mm, we need not more regulation because of challenges. We need actually more freedom for press, for media, and especially for professional media. Why I'm speaking about professional media? Because in, in our case, we are a small country which has a very interesting neighborhood. We have countries which has some really big challenges for professional journalists. I mean, uh, we have since 1996 uh, more or less independent media. It's not allowed in Lithuania since 1996 for government institutions, for municipalities, to own media. Nobody can uh, organize fake news stories on professional media because uh, we have uh, really big competition in the media field. And if someone provides uh, fake stories, 
most of media are reacting and they care about reputation. And also we have uh, public broadcaster and standards which can be like guidelines for let's say entertainment media and for not very professional media and the last slide will be re related to one only one recommendation which comes from me i was for many years journalist and public broadcaster and i remember uh, what we had before 1996 uh, in lithuania we had uh, tradition of soviet union uh, and most of media during Soviet Union, actually most of official media was uh, owned by, by state. And we had some, some kind of partisan media, which was in, in official, but since 1996, uh, we have only two kinds of media, two types of media. One of them are independent media, which has some ownership, uh, commercial media or just small media target media and public broadcaster and uh, we know how difficult it's in some countries which has no public broadcasters they have limited access uh, to go to commercial independent media because media market and, and 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 biggest media are controlled by government it's a biggest problem because we cannot speak about journalism at all if media are owned by states by governments we can speak out only about propaganda maybe hate speech hatred if countries have some conflicts and nowadays we can see how problematic it is uh, for us to find some solution especially for journalists for media in Ukraine and in Russia we do a lot of small projects uh, here in OC and in our country but we don't have solution till now because we don't have real independent and real good media in both of countries also in our neighbor countries like Belarus also we have state-owned media and we see how many cases we have when the journalists they leave this media because of censorship and I would say we need to help for our colleagues for journalists in countries which don't have public broadcasters to create public broadcasters and to close each state-owned media which belongs to government or state directly because state-owned media they cannot be platform for real independent journalism. We will discuss every, every time when we will have some conflicts how we can deal with propaganda. No one solution. Independent media or not. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Danish. You really bring us back to the subject that we have at the very heart of this conference of volatility by bringing up notions of aggressive communication, and giving us a couple of examples of um, uh, fake news um, in Lithuania with the um, story about the nuclear bomb being discharged and NATO soldiers and, and, and the um, situation in Ukraine. Um, but also, I think rather helpfully, you emphasize the importance of independent media to have a genuine, real, free independent media um, in a country and also I noticed that one of your slides although you didn't bring it up and uh, develop it much um, you had uh, critical thinking and media literacy um, mentioned something that will be discussed as another side um, event or not another, another side event at one of the um, uh, uh, sessions after this um, after this session um, on that note um, let me now open up the floor for questions and comments and I'd kindly ask um, participants to uh, raise their hands and when they speak, when they're called upon, to give their uh, name and their organization uh, before making their comment or question. Thanks. Okay, so I see, um, yes, first question here, sir. Я хотел бы выступить Сергей Горбачев, председатель Севастопольской организации Союза журналистов России. С учетом того, что тема Севастополя и Крыма сегодня звучала и распространялись определенные материалы. Можно выступить, да? Я, прежде всего, хотел бы поприветствовать госпожу председателя, участников данного форума, коллег. И, откровенно говоря, хотел бы сразу отметить, что многие сентенции, которые прозвучали в первой половине дня, вызвали у меня желание вступить в дискуссию. Хотелось бы, чтобы она проходила в конструктивном формате. Мне, приехавшему из Севастополя, из Крыма, где в феврале 1945 года, э, -го года в Ялте Великой Тройкой была определена конфигурация послевоенного мира, хочется договариваться. Поэтому агрессивный тон 
представительницы Украины меня и удивил, и разочаровал. Как и удивили, разочаровали аплодисменты, которые прозвучали после ее выступления. Мы говорим сегодня о дезинформации и фейковых новостях. Так вот, на мой взгляд, ее выступление вполне можно назвать фейковым. Особенно, что касается вопросов, связанных с ситуацией в Крыму и Севастополе в области средств массовой информации. Я ответственно заявляю, как председатель Союза журналистов Севастополя, что ни один журналист у нас не погиб. Никого у нас не похищали. Если вы в этом сомневаетесь, мы можем после э, этой дискуссии поговорить в куларах. Я вам постараюсь это доказать и от вас хотел бы услышать соответствующую аргументацию. Можно было бы еще о многом поговорить, поэтому, э, на мой взгляд, целесообразно было бы перевести so, специальное so, мероприятие. Could I just ask you to keep your um, statement short, and if you have a question, to pose it to this panel. Um, this is not a, um, a time to make any speeches, but, but if you have a question, just um, um, give your question, because I'd like to move on to other, other um, participants who might like to... Пять минут. Я, я специально приехал из Севастополя. Я думаю, здесь у вас представители Севастополя бывают очень yeah. редко. Я думаю, что... Можно было бы в Севастополе провести специальное мероприятие и на месте убедиться в том, как мы живем, чем мы занимаемся и что нас волнует. Прежде всего, хотел бы выразить признательность организаторам этого высокого форума за приглашение к участию в нем. Причем не просто личную признательность, а благодарность моих коллег, севастопольских журналистов, которые хотят быть услышаны не только читателями, зрителями, слушателями, потребителями информации, но и общественниками, независимо от взглядов, которые они придерживаются профессионалами медиа из других стран. Отдельное спасибо завершающей свою миссию представителю БСЕ по свободе СМИ Дуни Миатович, моим товарищам из руководства Союза журналистов России, а также, что немаловажно, соответствующим структурам ОБСЕ и Австрии, способствовавшим выдаче мне визы. Получить ее относительно легко было мне, хотя на самом деле жители Крыма и Севастополя не могут получать визы. К сожалению, практика Запада по дискриминации крымчан и севастопольцев по принципу гражданства и географической принадлежности не позволяет сегодня нам реализовывать свое право на свободу передвижения. Это тем более непонятно в связи с тем, что и до событий 2014 года на территории Крымского полуострова проживало несколько Sir, десятков тысяч граждан России. At the final uh, session of this conference um, in, in, in greater depth, if you like. I'd just like to make sure we maximize this opportunity and we appreciate your presence. From Хорошо, спасибо. Если вы гарантируете мне это, я с удовольствием это сделаю. We guarantee you that. Thank you. Um, so I, I saw a hand here. Uh, okay, um, so I, I saw a hand here. Yes, sir. He transferred to, to me, yeah? Uh, okay. Uh, меня зовут Юрий Артеменко. Я не дипломат. Я впервые на таком представительском форуме ОБСЕ, посвященном вопросам медиа. Почему? Потому что uh, я работаю главой Национального совета по вопросам... So which телем... organization are you from? Sorry? Which organization are you from? Yeah, yeah, I don't... Okay. Uh, почему? Потому что я работаю главой Национального совета по телевидению и радиовещанию Украины регуляторному органу Украины, который за последние три года запретил 78 российских каналов. Запретил не за качество. Качество российских каналов достаточно мощное, деньги ложатся хорошие. Запретили потому, что э, фейки, потому что в каналах идет разжигание вражды, не соблюдается Европейская конвенция по трансграничному вещанию. Не уважаются законы или, скажем так, грубо нарушаются законы страны на территории, которая вещаются. Могу сказать в то же время, что одновременно с этим за эти три года в Украине появилось и э, разрешены к просмотру более 160 иностранных телекомпаний. Компании не только, которые подписали Европейскую конвенцию про трансграничное вещание, но даже с таких далеких стран, как Корея или Индия. 
Здесь были упреки в первой части нашего семинара, были упреки в сторону Украины. Знаете, есть простая славянская пословица. В собственном глазу не видно спички, в собственном глазу не видно бревна, в чужом глазу видно спичка. Кейт Эдди упомянула и вызвала аплодисменты фразой о том, что до сих пор на российском телевидении не показывалась информация о проведении митинг, митинга в день 12 июня, в день, когда, собственно говоря, праздновался День независимости России. Я уверен, что выйдут эти митинги, покажут, немного их смонтируют, немножко сфайкуют, и они появятся в том виде, как это нужно. Я думал, какой, знаете, сразу скажу, вот мы говорим о понятиях фейка, и я как журналист, потому что я 20 лет стажа у меня журналистского, 10 лет в государственной власти, начинал с 18 лет, я могу сказать, что фейк надо делить на две части и говорить отдельно. Одно дело фейк, как неправдивая информация, которая нужна для того, чтобы поднять рейтинг издания, и здесь классический пример желтые таблоиды, желтая пресса, и другой пример фейк, как элемент пропаганды как элемент государственной политики. Вот я думал, какой пример привести, знаете, фейковой такой живой, я не готовился. И тут жизнь подкидывает сама мне такую тему. Мы с коллегой сейчас в перерыве, выходим на кофе перед этим час назад и слышим русский, русский голос. И журналист русский подходит к участнику русской делегации и говорит, вы скажите то, что вы не успели сказать, мы это запишем и покажем, как будто вы здесь выступили на семинаре. Мелочь, но чистый фейк. Другой фейк я получил вот сейчас буквально на минуту назад, я регулярно в силу своих обязанностей читаю новости Страткома, очередной фейк от России, очень классический. Украина сбила нидерландский самолет MH17. Теперь уже виноваты службы безопасности Украины. Практика, теория очень простая. Берется, сперва публикуется на малоизвестном прокремлевском сайте, Затем за два дня разгоняется по всем другим сайтам более ста. Затем в течение трех дней, это сообщение Страткома, переводится на 24, переводится so на 24 you have, you have языка. Yeah. Переводится на 24 языка и выдается уже как государственная новость агентством «Спутник» информационным государственным, но уже не с, воп... не с утверждением, а с вопросом. То есть здесь виден уже такой прогресс. Знаете, я, наверное, огорчу своих коллег, не изменится вот у нас отношение, не изменится фейки российские после нашей конференции. Для этого должно поменяться что-то в России. Поэтому собрались мы здесь не для того, чтобы, знаете, обсуждать фейки. Где источники фейка? В Литве? В Грузии? О чем мы говорим? Давайте об этом говорить. То есть тема должна говорить об одном. Окей, для... okay, thank you. Um, okay. So I see some hands at the back. Thank you so much. Not me. Мой, may I? Thank you. Thank you. My name is Peter Fyodorov. I am uh, Russian. I'm a member of the executive board of EBU, European Broadcasting Union. Also, uh, I am a member of the supervisor board of Euronews. Uh, I wouldn't mention other my heads. Uh, also, I am responsible for the foreign uh, affairs of the RTR. RTR is a Russian state television. Дальше я буду говорить по-русски. Спасибо большое. Очень интересная конференция, очень интересное выступление uh, литовского uh, участника. У меня к Литве самые теплые отношения. Был там. Хорошо знаком с uh, гендиром литовского общественного телевидения, если он остался. И, конечно же, то, что я видел на экранах, говорит о том, что источник фейка уж, по крайней мере, не, не российский. По крайней мере, подтверждение того, что это из России, никак нет. А переселение литовцев в Африку, наверное, это шутка. Я в Москве видел чудесный спектакль литовского режиссера, его коллектива Римуса Тумиса «Мадагаскар» где рассказывалось о мечте литовцев до, Первой мировой, до Второй мировой войны перебраться на Мадагаскар. Может, это какие-то реминисценции. Но я абсолютно согласен с выводом э, литовского представителя о том, что фейк ньюс на самом деле растение нежное. И э, один его источник – это непрофессионализм журналиста, 
либо нечестность журналиста, потому что то, что мы видели в первой презентации, рассказ о супругах, которые оказались сестром и братом, это, конечно, журналисты, которые это делали, они, конечно, понимали, что это фальшивка, но это был заказ, по всей видимости, медицинских учреждений, которые в этой истории видели привлечение новых клиентов. Что касается э, тех случаев, когда распространяются такие идиотизмы, как падение американского бомбардировщика с атомной бомбой в Литве, то, я думаю, это не профессионализм в первую очередь, если не злонамеренность. А в частности, и потому что есть классическое новостное правило – проверка из двух источников. Несоблюдение этого правила – это несоблюдение профессионализма в новостях. Ну и я абсолютно согласен с идеей о том, что главный способ э, уничтожения фейк-новостей как явления, хотя они существовали всегда и, наверное, долго пройдутся, это открытость информационного пространства. И здесь я очень коротко хочу вас познакомить с тем, что вряд ли вы знаете, хотя эта информация подготовлена Европейской аудиовизуальной обсерваторией, то есть инструментом Евросоюза. Это данные за 2015 год. Надеюсь, что в этом году будут опубликованы данные за 2016 год. Итак, если говорить о телевизионном информационном поле моей страны, в России вещает 2300 зарегистрированных телевизионных каналов. Еще раз, 2300. 80% из них частные каналы. Остальные 20 – это частичная государственная собственность, или государственных корпораций, или муниципалитетов, или городов. 600 каналов из 2300 – это иностранные каналы, зарегистрированные в России. So, so we really appreciate your, uh, в своем деревенском доме but I, but I за полтора евро в месяц. Sure this, нет, 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 um... от мы услышали обвинение в том, что многие соседи имеют только государственные This каналы. Поэтому это важный ответ. И только такое информационное поле может уничтожать фейки. За полтора евро в месяц я в своем деревенском доме вижу 300 каналов, 150 которых иностранные. Это BBC World, это CNN, это Франц Ван Катер, это Deutsche Welle, это Fox TV. И каждый человек, который знает хотя бы один из этих языков, может сравнивать то, что рассказывают мировые каналы, и то, что рассказывают его национальные каналы. Это открыто. В нашем интернете есть два агрегатора, которые переводят главные новости мировой газет в ежедневном формате. Нет ни одной критики, которая бы звучала в адрес Кремля, руководства, президента, даже оскорблений, которые не были бы нам известны из наших собственных СМИ, с нашего собственного информационного поля. Спасибо за внимание. Я видел, что меня слушали. Dear delegates, I just ask you to make very short comments out of respect, not even for the office, but for, for your fellow um, delegates. You know, this is an important conference that many people have traveled very far from. It's true, um, on a very important subject. And as a... Um, As the president of um, the Central European University in Budapest, Michael Ignatiev says, the best way of interacting here is to make short interrogative statements with, with a question mark at the end. In other words, a question. Uh, and if you could do that, it would be so much more effective. Um, so yes, now I call upon um, the lady with the gray sweater at the back on the right-hand side. Thank you. Thank you. Tamara Ginzurashvili, Media Development Foundation, Georgia. I have two short questions. First, to Barbara Bukowska. Could you elaborate a little bit on transparency of media ownership and financial sources, especially in online media, because it's easier to regulate in broadcast media, uh, and uh, it's necessary to allow public to know what's behind the, these fake stories. And the second question to all participants, is it right approach to discuss fake news and propaganda just from the perspective of media while it's a part of hybrid war and the country I represent and Ukraine are involved in war with Russia and hybrid war is used against our country. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm just going to take um, one other person for a question um, to the panel. Um, yes, sir. Tim Dawson from the National Union of Journalists in Britain and Ireland. 
What more can journalists themselves do to try and rid our trade of fake news? I do have some ideas myself, but I'll spare you those. I'll be interested to hear what the panel have to say. Thank you very much. Barbara, would you like to address the question about transparency of um, um, financial resources and, and journalism? Um, first question. So, in the, from the, I, the, the question about the pluralism and about the media ownership, uh, it refers actually to pluralism and diversity of the, of the media and the issue of the social media giants obviously present challenges to media diversity and pluralism in, uh, in converged environment. For the, for the traditional media, as you, uh, as you rightly pointed out, the rules are quite established and exist for the OSCE region as well as for those countries which are in the European Union and also in the joint declaration, the special rapporteurs as one of the tools and the responses to deal with fake news phenomenon stated the state should introduce clear rules prohibiting undue concentration of media, relation, uh, media ownership and also the, uh, should require the media outlets to be transparent about their ownership structures. They don't go into much detail about that, but the detail is elaborated in other international human rights and international standards on this. Uh, so I can refer you to those. In terms of the social media, the problems of transparency are not that much about the ownership since um, that's uh, pretty straightforward. In most cases, those are the shareholders at present. But the problem is the, the ways how they apply their terms of service to online content. And these are written by absolute lack of transparency and accountability. And then the social media are quite uh, you know, erratic and also unclear in the ways how they apply the, the standards for certain content, why they remove certain um, pictures on the basis of nudity, but they allow others, or why do they allow quite hostile physical threats against individuals, but then take other content, so, so we don't know. And that's among the recommendation as well to for the social media to be more transparent about the rules and criteria they use, and also they to apply them in a consistent manner, and to be also transparent in a number of requests and the solutions they take uh, from the states or from other actors to remove the con content and the number of removals they actually do. So for the social media, the issue of the transparency is primarily to, to the content. Uh, for the questions about what the, what the media can do uh, in terms of get rid of the uh, of the of the you know unscrupulous colleagues, this the, the joint declaration, but also in our uh, policy recommendations, we recommend very effective self-regulatory mechanisms. And that doesn't mean that the media just need to be regulated by themselves. Effective self-regulatory systems refer also to the systems where these uh, systems are open to uh, public scrutiny, which would have uh, public on the uh, decision-making bodies and these complaint mechanisms, um, you know, uh, not just uh, media regulating themselves, as is the problem in some countries. I detected you are probably from the UK. You, you know what is the problem there and how there was much resistance of the media houses to much more public scrutiny after Leveson inquiry. So we are calling for uh, for equitable and also tripartite sort of uh, self-regulatory system on that, but also abiding to the to the ethical standards for the media, which should be uh, um, developed by the self-regulatory bodies in the in the cooperation and consultation. Прошу, я хочу тут просто обратиться на те заявления от коллегов из Севастополя и из РАРТ. Here also the, the special, special rapporteurs have quite a considerable recommendations for you, and that means that the journalist should consider also using critical coverage of disinformation uh, propaganda as part of your new services. And I'm quite concerned about what the colleague from Russia TV highlighted as a sort of uh, environment in Russia for freedom of the, the press uh, being uh, demonstrated by a number of the media outlets being registered, which is totally not indicative of any media freedom because those uh, media outlets are largely either um, under the influence of the government 
or uh, those independent media would be self-censoring themselves or be on a receiving end of quite large crackdown from the government, including for the online sources, including the, the colleague from Sevastopol. Uh, what you highlighted would be quite, uh, uh, being quite a mouthpiece of the government rather than what special rapporteurs recommend as a critical coverage of disinformation present in the media environment in your region. So that would be my initial answers. Danish, would you like to add uh, something to what Barbara said in response to uh, Tim's question? Uh, yeah, I would just say that 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 I would for us, I think for you as well, um, it's very difficult to describe a government channel as independent. It's always problematic for a journalist to remain independent when they work for a government structure. If you want to be objective, you have to leave your job. So we're concerned by a situation when there aren't public broadcasters where people are free. All right, so I see um, a young woman at the back there with dark hair um, first, um, next, and then third question here. Yes. Thank um, you. Nina Yankovic. I'm a Fulbright Clinton Public Policy Fellow uh, doing work on disinformation in Ukraine. Um, I, I want to say I'm a little bit concerned about the tone of the discussion. I feel like we're putting the onus of solving this problem on journalists, and many of us here today are representatives of governments, so I'd like us to think a little bit about how governments can respond uh, to this problem in general. Um, and I think in my research I've, I've kind of uncovered that this is not really a crisis of, of journalism per se. It's a fact that state-sponsored actors, and I will go as far to say the Russian Federation, in particular in the OSC region, are exploiting a crisis of trust between people and their governments and people and journalists. Um, and I think one of the ways that we can repair this crisis of trust is to not only support independent journalism that does fact-checking and does investigative journalism, but local journalism, uh, which in my own country and in Ukraine and across much of the OSCE region we've forgotten about. And that's how we can really repair the, uh, the bondages that have broken there, reporting on news that really matters to people. So the question for the panel then is how best can government actors rebuild the local news climate that has uh, fallen away in the uh, in the days of digital journalism. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Ma'am. Hello, um, my name is Alex Taylor. I'm the head of press and public information for the OSCE special monitoring mission in Ukraine. Um, and actually it follows on very nicely from Nina's question there. Um, we are the primary source of impartial, independent information on the security situation throughout Ukraine. We publish our reports daily, uh, six days a week, in three languages. We're very active on our social media accounts. We're doing what we can to push out the information that our nearly 700 monitors from 44 different countries are producing on a daily basis. But what more can we do as an organization to help our journalist colleagues combat fake news or inaccurate reporting? That's what I would like to know from the panel, please. Thank you very much. Last, the trio of questions here, sir. Yes. Глеб Головченко, секретарь Национального союза журналистов Украины и руководитель Vremia, you spoke about me and you said that I had been one of the people who trained the storm uh, soldiers for Maidan. I didn't do that. I know that very well. And the photographs that they used to illustrate this reportage were from a live broadcast on my channel. So looking at the experience of Barbora, uh, at that time we made a submission to 
uh, the Russian television journalists and asked them to issue a, a, a correction, but they said that they don't do that. Then we tried to go to court. Now this is going through uh, the courts. This shows that the lying is taking place. There is absolutely inaccurate information, but the text and the tone of the uh, response, even in court, shows that they aren't prepared to apologize. They see themselves as the largest and best loved Russian television channel worldwide. And the next issue with regard to uh, legal provision. Now, in Russia, Pervy Canal broadcasts. Uh, then the company sends this up to a, a satellite. There are individual television channels in every country that then pass that signal on. And all of these companies, none of them bear responsibility for the content of the original Russian channel. These are different companies abroad. It's terrifying. We live by the laws of the Russian Federation. That's uh, some kind of self-regulation. Now, I'm sure the government has never really looked at this before, but when it comes to banning certain websites, something that we heard about today from our Russian colleagues, the thing is, the problem of social networks, which were banned in, in, in Ukraine, there is an extra aspect, namely suicides of children thanks to Sinikid uh, technology. And as a media outlet, we reported a lot on this, and we believe that the government was probably right to do what it did, because in so doing, we are protecting our children. On Kontakte, this Russian social network, um, there's no restriction on under 12 year olds. It's not like Facebook. They can use any resources they wish. So when we start to lose our children, we also speak about these problems. And finally, what I wanted to say is that I think we should add something to our agenda. We should have on weapons of mass media destruction. If you use uh, the machine gun Maxim. We need to put an end to that kind of uh, that kind of weapon of mass media destruction that destroys psyches around the world. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, let's now turn back to the panel. Um, David, would you like to perhaps take on um, Nina Jankovic's point or question about how best journalism? Um, can uh, support the, the climate for, for freedom of expression and in that way challenge fake news. Um, um, her point was about local journalism, but, but perhaps you could broaden it out to gen journalism generally. Um, um, and perhaps, Danish, you'd like to address that too? Okay, well, of course, the first issue is if we're addressing fake news, what do we mean by fake news? Because that term is so broad now, and according to our current president, it's pretty much any information he doesn't agree with. Uh, the, the obvious answer is for um, everyone in journalism to be you know, conscientious and accurate in their reporting, but that's a simplistic and kind of insulting answer because I'm sure everyone here already is. Uh, we can go a step further and say that perhaps journalists should do more in calling out their colleagues who partake in fake news, like the presentation I gave. There were a whole lot of publications that just ran a fake news story with doing no research, no checking whatsoever, just sort of rewording a story that was out, already out on the internet from a fake news site. Um, that really should be condemned more widely than it is, I think. Um, you know, we could even take it a step further and say perhaps journalists should maybe refuse to work for publications that traffic and fake news, even if it's not their sole or primary purpose. Although uh, I'm sure we're all, not all of us are so brave as to, you know, take steps like that when our own livelihoods are at stake. Um, and of course, uh, another issue is, uh, are we doing the right thing by taking it on? Uh, you know, there's still a lot of debate about whether calling attention to fake news just helps to spread fake news and entrench it in people's minds 
or are we better off sort of ignoring it and flooding uh, our sources with good news? Uh, it's a difficult issue and um, it's not one that can be just left to journalists, but certainly journalists can do a lot more, say, working with fact checkers like we are, as I said, in both linking to fact checks, trying to call out the, the sources that are propagating the fake news. Um, yeah, thanks, David. It, that really reminds me of um, Kate Aidey's call on, um, on all of us, particularly journalists, to stand apart from the purveyors of fairy tales and the salesmen of propaganda this morning. Journalists themselves need to be leaders. Um, Danish, would you like to respond to that question there? I would like just add to a few remarks uh, about good news for us, for journalists maybe, it can be also uh, the fact that people are interested sometimes in some topics which are for us not that number one uh, topics uh, as for journalists. We are dealing very much with politicians, with uh, business issues, with a lot of things which are, which seems for us are very important for people. But generally speaking, people are interested also in, in, in many, many um, different uh, topics which are outside professional media. That's why we need a little bit uh, more change also also, uh, also at the editorial. But generally speaking, the biggest challenge is also the ownership of media. And I would say when you speak about uh, fake news and uh, free flow of fake news in, in, in mainstream media, the general problem is if uh, media are owned by, by governmental institutions, we need to uh, to propose for each participant countries to guarantee for journalists, for media independency from state structures, for government institutions. It will be the first very important stage for development of independent media, professional journalists, and, and so on and so on. Because if some person, some people provide some small stories, fake, fake news somewhere with 1,000 maybe subscribers or something like that, professional media can react if they are dealing with people, not with politicians. If I deal with politicians, they don't care about uh, fake, fake news. Mm. Barbara, just turning to you, the, um, the gentleman from um, Ukraine in, in the last round of questions mentioned the right to correction um, and right to reply. Is that a good response to, to fake news out there? So the right of correction and reply is considered under international human rights standards to be a, a less restrictive remedy as sort of, you know, censorship, uh, outright censorship or fines or some sort of closing of the media outlet. So indeed, uh, this, and they are often also issued by the self-regulatory bodies. So we support this mechanism as a less restrictive measure. However, certain conditions should be met. And there is also a recommendation of the Council of Europe, which applies to some of the countries about what these conditions should be and how they should be applied in free speech compliant matters. So Definitely, that's uh, one of the possible remedies. But I also want to address the questions which uh, you, you said, or the comment which you said about you uh, called for more restrictions and sort of blocking or filtering certain content under the, the, the disguise of protecting children. And you know, just be careful what you wish for, because the, the blocking and filtering of entire website or certain content without further reflections of what are you doing would uh, backfire against you quite prominently. And even for the suicide or some sort of self-harm sites, some experts say that it's uh, not actually effective to remove them because that can be also a way how to spot some you know, problematic behavior and save the people. So if some teenagers are exhibiting you know, suicide tendencies on Facebook or through those sites, there can be like you know, early rescue mechanisms put in place, so the, the, the response is not always the, the censorship, but also the fact that some of these terms would be quite difficult to put in place without really proper assessment of the context, and it's very difficult to do it through external, you know, I mean, for the, for the social media without going in depth into this context, given the amount of information that is available online, so be careful there, and also special rapporteurs in there joint declaration warn against uh, those measures as well as against the measures some of the Russians colleague mentioned uh, about, the, about the taking down the, si the, the, the radio um, broadcast or other broadcast uh, without the core decision or some really thorough assessment whether the decision meets international freedom of expression standards. But also there was a question about the, what the state uh, can do and the perception that this issue is left on the journalists. 
that's uh, prob probably wrong because the onus is indeed on states, but indeed the onus is on states to ensure that the environment for the freedom of expression it's not restrictive. That's not the case in many of the OSCE's countries. So really the states need to make sure that they do not restrict free speech and Julian create this environment which I referred to uh, previously and which special rapporteurs put in the joint declaration quite thoroughly. An important aspect is also public service media and its importance for the local news because if you have really independent, which is not the case for the state media, but for independent and well resourced and um, and proper public service media, they should cater for local news and local, uh, local needs and local concerns. So that's one of the ways how to, to support local news and the, now with the austerity measures in the West, but also with the state control, that's not the case. And then also the state subsidies or other support for the local media news, which has been totally missing and in the past, of course, have been also misused to give to political cronies or those supportive, so that's obviously need to be done in a fair and equitable manner, but also these measures should be, should be explored and also working with the social media that now drive great advertisement revenue for them to support local, needs, uh, local news productions and you know, some of them are already doing it, like you know, Facebook um, journalism project or Google journalism project, but that obviously needs to be more done uh, and the advertisement revenues need to be also put to towards the original content production and local news. Thanks, Barbara. We have time for just one more question um, or very brief comment um, because we have to finish at 3.30. Yes, a question from, uh, a comment from um, the gentleman um, with the white goatee. Спасибо. Юрий Казаков. А нет. Да, простите, ради бога. Юрий Казаков, я представляю... I am from the Russian uh, self-regulation body. Now, we heard some complaints about the press. I'd like to make a little piece of information here. Nobody complained about Russian television. Now, I've looked through uh, 166 different complaints, and I think one in three is about a Russian television channel. There was even a complaint from the Ukrainian Commission. We examined it back in the day, and that was a complaint about Russian television. Just wanted to correct something there. Now, the main thing is that today we don't really talk very much about fakes. I'm extremely disappointed because I don't have enough, enough uh, an impression or an understanding of what a fake is and how it might interest us. Now, the issue of the brother and sister that was provided as an illustration here, I think that's a problem that should be solely addressed by journalists. That's a problem of professional ethics. We shouldn't just be interested in, in, in uh, false news or fake news in my view. We should be interested in news that runs counter to security and which undermines cooperation. Now, I'm only talking about Russia here. Can we depend on journalists alone? Journalists don't have the resources to counter pro-state propaganda. Pro-state Propaganda. I want you to pay attention to the fact that I say pro-state and not state or government. Now, most of the propaganda that we have going on is being uh, put together by non-government organizations, not government bodies. And if we're going to talk, in, uh, talk here about fakes, I think for a long time, all of the media self-regulatory bodies, I think we've got four uh, such representatives in the room today who do a similar job to uh, me. We've understood that propaganda exists and we have issued recommendations on how to counter propaganda. Ultimately, what we're talking about now is not just propaganda, but political propaganda with elements of hate speech. Now, I think that if we're going to focus on fakes, um, of course, fakes are a form of propaganda. Uh, propaganda makes use of disinformation too. This is a whole toolkit. So we should also be interested in fakes which have a political backdrop, which contain hate speech and, I would say once again, things that might fundamentally cause us problems with regard to security and cooperation. Thank you. So the subject of hate speech, which... Uh
so-called hate speech um, is, a, is also a sort of misnomer in international law because it doesn't exist as such. But what ought to be the responses to harmful speech, which is often categorized as hate speech, in other words, incitement? Um, and Barbara, perhaps you could just um, explain briefly what the international human rights law position is. So hate speech is the same term as fake news. It can mean whatever you want, and it would be a great mistake to treat all forms of so-called hate speech in the same manner. Because under international law, you have to distinguish between different types of harm that can be caused by certain speech, and then modify your responses to it uh, accordingly. So not everything is genocide, and not incitement to genocide, and should not be treated as such. So they, at Article 19, we always call for sort of, you know, we call it pyramid response to hate speech. So at the top of it is the most serious one, which is regulated by international humanitarian law, is the incitement to genocide, and it's the most serious, and states have an obligation to uh, prohibit it. Then there is incitement to violence, hatred, and discrimination, which, however, is not like, you know, saying, you know, I hate certain ethnic group. It needs to meet certain threshold of dangerousness. So that depends on who is the speaker, who is the targeted audience, what is the likelihood of this speech resulting in this undesirable uh, result, such as, you know, violence. Then what is the likelihood between them to happening? So it's not just like, this is hate speech, it needs to be banned. And then there is also, you know, sort of lower form of hate speech, which you can prohibit, because in certain contexts, such as schools, kids have an obligation, uh, or the states have an obligation to ensure that there is a, you know, proper access to education or at the workplace. So this can be also in, uh, prohibited on the basis of rights of the others. But then there is also a broad range of, you know, hate speeches, which is problematic in terms of tolerance and diversity in the society, but it's better to be approached and tackled with other forms rather than censorship. And actually, studies show it can be contraproductive if that's treated in the same manner as those other types I mentioned. And there, the counter speech and you know, pluralism and ensuring that the critical voices can respond to these forms are much more effective. So I would caution against sort of one solution fits all to fight certain expression under the rubric of hate speech and look at this issue really closely and ensure that freedom of expression standards are respected at the same time. Thanks, Barbara. To wrap up, I'm just going to ask the panelists to give one single recommendation to participants um, to take away with them um, as a as kind of a key message from this panel, starting with David. David. Okay. Well, I hope this doesn't sound like a, a lecture. Um, and I know it's difficult to say in you know, the current uh, environment of the news media where everything is driven by click-throughs and page views and being five minutes later than your competitor can make a huge difference. But uh, I think in a greater sense, it's uh, that a mundane truth is always better than a you know, good or sensational but false story. And, you know, no matter how much it might pain us to not be as popular, uh, we have to stick to the truth as much as possible and you know, not go for what's, you know, easy and popular. Because um, as I said, like the example I showed, there's just too much of that. People just replicating fake news because it's sensational, it gets page views. Um, when you could be covering something else that's, true, not as, not as exciting, but actually has a real impact on people's lives, and it's not just there as entertainment. Great. Go for the mundane truths, not entertainment or exciting, um, false news. Uh, Danish. I, I was just at um, uh, one remark. Uh, in countries which has uh, public broadcasters and diversity of media market, they have less conflicts and less problems with uh, fake news, actually. And uh, countries which has uh, very strict rules and uh, domination of one kind of media, they have more problems. And e even if you speak about related problems to hate speech and propaganda issues, actually you need to change the situation this way. Great. So media diversity and pluralism. Yeah, exactly. Finally, Barbara. Yeah. So for the states in the room, make sure that you familiarize, familiarize yourself with the joint declaration and take, uh, uh, put into practice all the recommendations there. And for the non-states people in the room, please stop using this term fake news. 
and instead look at the harm which the particular statement you are targeting um, is causing. Okay, thank you very much um, to the panelists. Um, the, uh, the office is very grateful that you participated in this panel and uh, we hope that uh, participants gained from this. Um, and again, um, to echo Barbara and what I said before and what others have said, please look at the joint declaration. Uh, thank you very much. There is now uh, a break um, and then one of the sessions which follow in this room will look at one of the responses to fake news, which is media and digital literacy. So if you're interested in this topic, um, come back. Thanks very much. <laughs>